We're about to start our third and final panel discussion. The title of this panel discussion is High Speed Leadership, Time Critical the Teamwork. Leaders are often tasked with developing contingency plans, identifying possible obstacles, and establishing strategies to overcome them. What happens though when all plans go out the window? The best leaders form strong, instinctual bonds with their teams, allowing individual actions to mold into unit actions. A team acting in unity is then able to make rational decisions and create sensible strategies during times of extreme stress and time, and, and time critically. The moderator for this panel is Professor Stephen Raggy, and the panel members are Captain Greg Boss Woldridge, United States Navy retired, former commanding officer of the Blue Angels, Special Agent Kenneth Croak, the Deputy Assistant Director, uh, Office of Field Operations at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And finally, Captain William Triplett, United States Navy, Class of 89, United States Naval Academy, Staff of the Chief of Naval Operations. Thank you. Happy socks. Well, very good. It's great to see you all, but we can't see you all. All we see is a very bright glare of lights. I remember hearing General Amos say that last night. So let us know if you can't hear us. I don't know how you'll let us know, but if you can't hear us, do let us know. And. Um, we're here to, to do, as I've, I've asked a number of midshipmen, what you would like us to do. What would you like this, this panel to be like? And a number of people were very helpful. Akbar was the most helpful. He said, you've got some people here with extraordinary experience and expertise. They've done it, and they're very good at how they do it. They've put together teams that were responsive and quick to adapt and ready to rise to an emergency. This is fast action leadership that they have practiced. So what I heard is, sir, get out of the way and <laughs> let them speak. And so that's, that's what I'll do. Each person who you've already heard introduced will speak for a few minutes, some a little longer than others, to lay out what they've done and what they've learned. But the greater part of the panel will be a conversation among them and with you, so we'll have plenty of time for questions, so I'm sure you are storing them up already. We decided that we would ask Captain Woldridge of the Remarkable Sox to go <laughs> first. So, Captain Woldridge, please. Thank you, Doctor. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm sure that you, being here at the Academy, certainly share that, that emotion. We said that on the Blue Angels all the time, glad to be here. <laughs> and it really set a foundation for the way we approached what we did. No matter whether you're having a terrible day or a great day, you always appreciated what you were getting to do and the fact that you were glad to be here. I even have a glad to be here sticker <laughs> on the back of my cell phone. It helps me to stay in tune and in touch with, with life and it really has after my experiences with the Blue Angels, given me some, some real strong targets to head for. So the Blue Angels, you've seen them fly, right? How many have seen it, seen the Blue Angels fly? Great, great. <laughs> I, and one other thing, I'm glad to be here because I'm glad to share the stage with these, these great gentlemen. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to hear what they have to say. But the Blue Angels, so as Admiral Bull said, they're kind of iconic for flight demonstrations. Uh, by the way, I was not the flight leader he was speaking of. A lot of you were probably here for that. The team is based on a culture, and the culture is very strong. And that particular team did drift away from the values that we set on the team. And we know, have to know how to make that course correction 
And the leader, and you're all going to be leaders, you all are leaders now, you're going to be leaders, has to know how to be involved to recognize those things that set you off course. Nonetheless, once that correction is made, and it was made on the blues, and that was the first time since 1946 when the blues were founded that we had something like that happen, we did achieve and they continue to achieve excellence every time they go flying and everything they do. That was the hallmark of the blues, the attainment of excellence, despite the different obstacles and the way things changed all the time. We're talking about today how to handle those evolving, unexpected situations that happen as a leader in a high intensity and a high speed environment. And I'll talk about that a little bit today with the blues. What are the things that allowed us to set that culture of excellence was trust. And I know Admiral Bull again talked about that considerably in his speech earlier today. I like to look at the interpersonal workings of trust based on four C's. The first one is competence. And that doesn't mean you have to be the ace of the base in the flying world. It just means you have to know how to do your job and others can expect that you're gonna be able to do your job competently. The second C is character. Honesty, integrity, fidelity. The things you do when no one's looking, right? How you interact with each other. Character. The third one is commitment. What is the commitment you have toward each other, toward that goal? It has to be there to develop that high level of trust like the Blue Angels had. The, third, the fourth one is the one that can tumble the first three, and that's consistency. So you can have the highest character, the greatest commitment, and be highly competent. But if you're not consistent, others cannot trust you. So it's so important to be consistent. And that's how we got to this interpersonal relationship where we could, I could call the formation into a turn. I would say, coming left, okay. And on the K and K, my right wingman would start turning into me, whether he saw me move or not, because he knew, he trusted me. I had the cadence, the consistency to start moving those airplanes, start moving on that K and okay, and the K, okay. He knew I'd start moving, so he could turn into me with all the trust in the world. You break that consistency, and then you're gonna have some problems. Training, training was critical, and we trained to our routine, but we trained to those backup things that you do when the routine doesn't, no, is no longer the routine. You train to contingencies, risk management, mitigating risk. We trained to it, we trained and we trained and we trained based on the beliefs that we started out with. You commit to those beliefs, you train, and then we would brief based on what we had trained to and brief in those contingencies. So when those emergencies arose, you'd be ready to face them. Mentoring was part of training. And I know you do that an extraordinary amount here and it's fantastic. One of the things that bring, brings success is what I call purpose larger than self. As we went around as blue angels, there would be a tendency maybe for one of the guys to say, I can fly closer than what it's called for. I can do better than you can on the left wing, on the right wing. It wasn't about individual light shining on you. It was about that purpose for the whole evolution, for the whole enterprise. I know enterprise means a different thing in the Navy, but for the whole squadron and for the Navy and for what you represented. So the purpose larger than self was so critical we had to, you know, you might want to come in there being selected to do something like this, come in with an inflated ego, if you will. We had to really watch out for that, knowing that what we did was important for the team, not individually. That said, we all wanted to do perfectly and it was never attained. Other thing that can happen, and I like to talk about it in, in, in the vein of emergencies or unexpected things, and I, use, I like to use the term texture. So, we all like things that are smooth like silk, right? We always like flying in smooth air. It made what we did so much easier. But 
if we knew there was going to be bumps out there, like you find an airliner, the captain says, well, folks, it looks like we're going to hit some rough air up here. We're going to have to have you buckle up. That's texture. The bumpiness, and it made our job so much harder. And if we could brief it, great. And as a leader, when you know there's going to be a situation come up, a little bit of texture, you have to hold steady with what you've got. You can't let the trust in you be diminished by reacting or flinching to those items of texture, those things that come up that you hadn't planned on. So texture is a great word to keep in mind when it comes to things that aren't in the ordinary or what you expect and how you react to that. And texture is not always a bad thing. Sometimes we're at our best when things are at their toughest and we learn from that. So as we took these beliefs and this training and the briefings to get ready to go flying and then executed the flights based on trust, we usually came out with pretty good results, but after that was the most important thing we did, and that was to debrief. And as you go out into your units, out into your, your fleet units or whatever, think about debriefs. And, and the way we did it was the glad to be here debrief. I talked about glad to be here. Glad to be here debrief lets you pull out from individuals who are keyed on purpose larger than self, pull out what has happened in that flight, in that evolution, or whatever you were doing. High speed run, whatever it is, you can pull it out if you have a debrief and you're glad to be here from that, from that attitude of saying, in my case with the blues, if I were at the table and we were debriefing a flight, I'd say, we'd sit down to debrief, I'd say, okay, this is how I felt generally about the flight, pretty smooth there, really enjoyed it, not much texture today. We did okay, in my opinion, and here's what I did wrong. And here's how I can improve. And these are my mistakes and I'll fix them, and I am glad to be here. And it would go to my wingman. He'd say, thanks boss, I felt pretty good about the flight today, here's some things that I could have done, here are my safeties, we called everything that was wrong a safety, and here's how I'll fix that. No finger pointing, it was all self exposing. And it was that glad to be here with a purpose larger than self. And that's how we got to the level of of expertise that we, that we could attain, attain there. Never getting it totally right, but always trying to make it, trying to get it to perfection. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna shut up now, but I wanna give you a couple keywords as you line up for the microphones, because I wanna tell you these stories, because I hear you love stories, right? We all love sea stories, especially at the Naval Academy. We love sea stories. <laughs> That's right. Okay, here's the keywords. Disneyland and mid-air collision. That doesn't sound so pretty, does it? and morale, and I, if, you, if you can pick up one of those, I'd be glad to hear it, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Will, sir. <laughs> I think I'm gonna yeah. Good Let's afternoon. Ken's going, sorry. Rule number one, don't ever follow the leader of the Blue Angels when you have to speak. <laughs> that would be the most important thing you learn from me today. Uh, I just wanted to spend my time just giving you a little bit of background. I'm from uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, uh, commonly known as ATF. A lot of people don't know who we are. We're getting more and more well-known. Um, the good thing is we're pretty well-known in the criminal environment. We, <laughs> <laughs> our structure is a little bit different, so I want to spend a little bit of time just explaining what that structure is, because some of the stories or some of the events that I talk about won't make a lot of sense if I don't explain our structure. It is different. We do glean a lot from the military. We spend a lot of time training with the military, both operationally and management-wise. Um, our basic structure is you have a criminal investigator, special agent, and then it'll go from there to a group, and you'll have groups of special agents. Generally, a group makes up about 10 agents, depending on the area, it could be more or less. A group supervisor or a resident agent in charge will oversee that group. Above that, you'll have an ASAC who oversees generally eight to 10 group supervisors. Then you'll have a SAC who will oversee the ASACs who oversee their racks. That makes up one division. We have 25 divisions that cover the United States. The, some divisions are bigger than others. We have, New Jersey has four groups, very small. A lot of political reasons why that is just that size. And then we have Houston, which has 20 some odd groups. Um, so not all the groups and not all the, the divisions are set up uh, in that way. Everybody receives the same basic training. Um, we go through a criminal investigator school where you'll have a lot of different agencies, not just ATF, that train there. 
and then they go to our own um, academy for six months where they specialize in ATF, whether it be tactics, the types of investigations that we work, and so forth. The things that we, violent crime is our number one priority. Um, in that is terrorism. We also investigate explosives, arson, um, but mostly we spend our resources in gang activity. We do a lot of undercover type operations. We'll do some whodunits, something blows up. Um, we'll try to figure out who did it and prosecute them. Something burns down, same thing. But a lot of it is working undercover operations, whether through informants or through agents. Two, the two incidents that I'll talk most about today, um, based on whatever questions that you ask, um, are an undercover operation that I was involved in, where we infiltrated a uh, major outlaw motorcycle gang. There's five major gangs in the United States. Um, the gang that we infiltrated was the Pagans. I was the undercover on that. I infiltrated them and reached officer status within this gang. So I lived with these idiots for two years. Um, and then also I was at the Boston Marathon bombing. I arrived there five minutes after the second device detonated. Um, I was in charge of the forum scene. I was at the Watertown shootout. And so there was a lot of, as you can imagine, a lot of management issues that were involved in that incident. So the, the undercover operation will be more specific incidents, overview, trust, as was mentioned earlier, trust in your team. When you're infiltrating a group, as dangerous as this group is, you have to have trust that your team outside, A, knows where you are, what, what you're doing. More importantly, that they're not gonna compromise your risk. And so having that trust and how to build that trust. A lot of it comes back to, as was mentioned before, the training. Training with the people that you're gonna work with. Through training, you, you start to realize not everyone has the same skill sets. And sometimes feelings get hurt, but if you've got somebody, and I use an example, if you're gonna ram a door, you're probably not gonna pick a 100 pound guy who hasn't ever seen a weight room to be the ram. <laughs> you may hurt his feelings, he may be, hey, it's my turn, too bad. Get the guy who can swing the ram and get through the door. Um, and there's a lot of different skill sets. Some people are better at surveillance, some people are better at interviewing, so forth. Use those people's skill sets. Teach those that you can, but at a certain point, you have to use the ones that have the highest skill set. And with that, I'll turn it over and I can relay more of those real life activities towards the questions that you people ask. Thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, great to be back on the yard. As you can probably tell, um, I don't have a problem projecting. I could probably do without the microphone <laughs> from my time as a company commander here uh, five years ago. Um, <laughs> I can think of no place I'd rather be than, than right here, obviously, especially since it gets me out from behind uh, my desk at the Pentagon and kind of gets me reconnected with, uh, with you all here on, on the yard. Uh, Dr. Reggie, uh, Boss Woolridge, and Special Agent uh, Croak, uh, it's my honor to be here on this panel here with, with, uh, with you all. And I also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Ms. Shima Sheiks for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I thought this, this panel topic is a really interesting one to me. Uh, because because things happen and, and and you know you know stuff happens or whatever that you want to call it I don't have a cool sticker that says that but you all know what I mean uh, especially when you're studying for a, a wires or a cables exam right and you forgot to do that and it's coming up uh, you know you can be the most prepared you can be the most trained and you can be the most ready crew or, or unit on the waterfront but there's always going to be that time where your team will be called to do the extraordinary uh, what, you, what do you do? How do you handle that? How do you manage the, that event? You know, these are all great questions uh, for you to ponder, but they really don't have any easy answers, and I don't think this panel is going to give you the, the, the cookie-cutter approach. But, but I kind of want to start off, and then I will go, up, go ahead into to the one story that will kind of harp on some of the themes that you've heard on today. Um, I was in command of USS McCampbell, and at the uh, end of a patrol, and it was my last underway as the commanding officer. We were in the South China Sea, headed home to Yokosuka, and you know, uh, and I couldn't be, be, I was sad to give it up, but, but I knew that my time had, had actually come. So I, they woke me up one night due to an engineering casualty. Uh, it was casualties to one of my uh, main reduction gears, which meant that I had just lost one of my two shafts. Okay, that's why I, two shafts on a DDG. So, uh, so we're still good to go and stay out on patrol and head home. Day passes, everything's fine, and another casualty happens to the other shaft. Mm. Uh, this time, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, the, uh, the casualty was uh, the control console in the central control station in the engineering, which basically is the 
brain of the engineering plant couldn't talk to either engine on my one remaining good shaft. Okay, I said, hey, that's not a problem. That's why we have local control consoles in that engine room. But they couldn't control the engines either. We were basically dead in the water for about an hour until we could figure this out. And did I fail to mention that we were still 1,700 miles from home? <laughs> Uh, eventually, uh, my team found a way for us to get back underway, uh, continue with flight operations, and stay, and stay there on patrol. But what this entailed for us was essentially control those engines mainly from the engines themselves with a get home box. There was no way for us to give standard commands like a head one third or a head five knots. So we had to figure out what a specific power factor was and what speed that equated to along with calculating, uh, giving the command, and seeing the ship actually respond to that given command. So let me expound on this. There was absolutely no book procedure for what we were doing. <coughs> this was my team attacking a problem and figuring it out and keeping us on the mission. We consulted experts ashore and found that no one had ever seen anything like what we were going through. And Essentially, we were on our own. I will also tell you that there is nothing like motivation to get home that will spur some innovation. So, <laughs> so, they, so in the end, we made it home safely. And uh, that was absolutely the longest week of my life. So how did we accomplish this? Well, two words you've already heard. Training and trust. Both words are intertwined as the crew had to be well trained in order to think through this complex challenge. And they had to trust that their training had properly, properly prepared them for this event. I'm a big proponent of robust training. You have to train the way you fight. It's more than just a saying. I'll say it again. You got to train the way you fight. So as such, we train every single day. It, in the beginning, it was very rough uh, as the crew was brand new. You see, about half of them had come over from a frigate, uh, Gary, and the other half had come from the crew in San Diego, as we were at the time the newest DDG forward deployed in Yokosuka and had conducted a hull swap. And I had become the com commanding officer about a month before we did this hull swap. As such, our learning curve was much steeper in learning to act as a team and be a good, solid crew. Uh, the training started with the basics and worked towards more complex scenarios. Training was the cornerstone of building the strong team able to tackle those tough challenges and building that trust that comes with high performing teams. There are going to be situations, however, that you can't foresee or understand. Training cannot account for every single instance that you will come across. It is simply impossible to account for these myriad perturbations. What training can do, however, is provide you with the confidence, getting that word again, in your knowledge, in your shipmates, and in your ability to tackle the toughest problems. Now that brings me to the part about trust. The crew needed to trust and be confident in their ability and training. We needed to come up with a way to stay out on patrol and knew that we had consulted everyone we could and coming up with the same answers or basically confirming what we knew. Now you would think there would be a lot of concern, and there was, but there was never, ever, ever a lack of faith in the sailor's ability to get us home. The crew rallied around this situation for what was a long week for me, it was just another week for them because we figured it out and it came up with a good plan. And we told them what was going on, communicated with them, and, and, and again, different departments on the ship, other departments supported the engineers and knew what they were going through and knew that they had the ability to, to get us home. So I only share this story with you as a great example, I have plenty, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, of, what, uh, of what the panel was about. Uh, again, uh, working together, Trusting each other and training and staying positive and motivated through tough situations is, is, uh, is a way to get through this. These are not easy things to accomplish, particularly given that there is no way to predict or prepare for it, the unknown. Leadership by all involved from 
you know, me or you down to the person that's, you know, the lowest person manning that engine is critical and ability to trust in yourself and the person that's actually the lowest person in there, the most important person on that ship at that time was the person manning that engine who was a junior person. You have to be able to trust them. It will be able to get you through those situations. So I'm, I thank you for your attention. I look forward to your to the questions and the discussion with my esteemed panel members. Outstanding, thank you. I have a question, and then we'll take questions from the audience fairly shortly, but I, I missed something here, Special Agent Croak. It sounds like, like Captain Wildridge had a pretty phenomenal team that he could depend on, and it's clear that Captain Triplett had an amazing team who could pull him through, and it sounds like you had a motorcycle gang. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was my team. That um, was your team. No, they, they thought they were my team. No, there was a team. Um, there was many agents involved in the covering of this operation. When you move from venue to venue, um, there's a cover team that's there. Um, most of our operations, there'd be a transmitter where they're listening oh, and hearing. Okay. Not this particular operation. We were regularly um, wanted for RF detectors. There were meetings that we were completely naked, which I got to tell you is a bad experience with a bunch of <laughs> motorcycle gang members, um, where you'd be sitting there so there were no wires. You're so, literally clothing less so that people could see you're not carrying yes, a wire. And these so. are some ugly human individuals. Yeah, um, so. <laughs> it, um, but, so, but there was a team, and there were logistics that were involved. There was management oversight. There was US attorney's offices involved. Um, there was a, a giant team. Everyone kind of focuses on the undercover, and, and really it's not. There's a whole lot more to it. The case agent, it, the person who coordinates everything, gathers the evidence, it keeps that stuff intact. Yeah. I had 1,700 hours of recording. Somebody has to track all that, all the evidence, the purchases, and so forth. There's a lot of logistics behind the scenes that goes into that, and that team doesn't get enough of the credit. And you've got to be behaving impeccably so that any evidence you gather can be used in a court of law and all of this stuff. The right? first thing they do is they attack you. I was accused of all sorts of doing this drug, selling this drug. Um, and yes, you have to be above approach. A lot, you have a lot of recordings, but you can't record everything. Right. And so um, there were times I was drug tested during the investigation. We have random drug testing and so forth. Um, I simulated the use of drugs. And um, of course, so they're saying he used drugs. Well, they thought I did. but. You know, in, in fact, it's all documented as you go through yep. the investigation to cover you. Got it. And I understand how Captain Woolrich would communicate. He would say, OK, and on K, he'd move. And I understand how Captain Triplett communicated. But if you're there without any wire, without anybody, how do you communicate with your team when you need to? You just kind of don't. There were, time, well, there were times um, that you couldn't, that, you know, uh, but oftentimes you could texting. You know, there was, a, mm. you know, I had a, uh, a setup of a girlfriend mm -hmm. where, uh, oh yeah, I was texting my girlfriend and there was actually a female on the other side of that phone because right. there would be times they'd take your phone, yeah. communicate that way. Um, there were times that we were coming up with plans and as the other panel members have said, you have this great plan on what you're going to do. Um, and almost every day it, it changes. And so what you rely on is your own training, but also those that are with you and your team that they can adapt. They see, hey, we're supposed to go to this point here buy a gun and come back to here and it doesn't go that way. We go to this point here and also we're going somewhere else. They don't know where it is. They have to adapt. And if they don't adapt correctly, if they blow your cover, it's, it's going to affect you obviously. Yes, a lot more it's going to affect them. Yeah. So you want to just have those right team members there. Wow. Interesting. Captain. I'd like to make a comment about Captain Triplett's story. I used to uh, think about the Blue Angels. There's six pilots. It's the six, you see six airplanes up there. You think, wow, that's really cool, you know. So that's kind of like lightning. And George Will uses a expression that in any evolution there's one part of the evolution a part of the organization that's the lightning and then there's the other part that's the thunder and I want you to remember this when you go to your units or your training or whatever it may be you know those six airplanes flashing around the skipper up on the bridge and his crew up there navigator and those folks they're kind of like the lightning you know they're up there watching everything go and it's all coming up to them from the thunder you can't have the lightning without the thunder for mm -hmm. us it was that hundred maintenance folks mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. made things work. You know, maintenance, admin, didn't matter what you did, swept the floors. We were a strong team. Each of them owned a piece of the outcome. And that's when, you're, when you are the lightning, that's what you have to keep in mind, the thunder. What gave you the strength to accomplish this mission, you know, or, or get this done, or do your stuff day in and day out? There's some thunder there that you never can forget about, and you have to recognize them. And how does that team work? No matter what you do on that team, you keep that level of respect 
because you know each and every one of them are doing the best they can, or as a leader, you're going to inspire them, get their commitment to do the best they can. So thunder and lightning, think about that. And I like that story about the, the two shafts going out and, and, you know, just the folks down in the, in the bowels are working their tails off and without, you know, without the light shining on them, but without them, it wasn't going to happen. Well, absolutely. And it's the, the culture that was inculcated that, that you see in each of your units. You, you have it here uh, and at the Naval Academy and, and your other uh, lesser academies. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> so, uh, and, and the, uh, but, but no, in all seriousness, that, that's, that's here. When you are a part of a high performing uh, team, uh, it's, it's about the culture that's inculcated from the top down and that everybody's job is important. And when you get in, what happens is every, what, every June or May, you know, you got, you know, new class going out, new class coming in about July. So you get that, you know, have fun with them, but you inculcate them into your culture and you want to make sure that they are able to contribute as soon as they can into that culture because it's a winning culture. Now everybody, and, and, and the great example, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not a fan, but, but a great example, it has to be in, in a current one, uh, is the New England Patriots. I, I mean, and, <laughs> but, but, I will t but, but you gotta look at that from how are they able to plug and play the myriad pieces around a couple of key folks and still continue to perform. I mean, to be able to host four championship, mm -hmm. AFC championship games in six years is an impressive feat. To go to nine Super Bowls, that's, that's, that's impressive and kind of, and that is an impressive organization and they, and they built that, you know, and if you go all the way back, they were considered a laughing stock many, many years ago when I was growing up. Now they're, they're the model franchise. So it's all about the culture and that stems from you. So you'll say, okay, Captain, I'm gonna walk on and I'm gonna be the lowest person on the team but you're gonna go into that culture and then you're gonna be a division officer and, you, and you're gonna have responsibility for whatever in your unit that you will have. And you, ha you can affect that unit by through a lot of the things that we're talking about and contributing to the culture and, and the, uh, the success of what you, can, uh, what you are leading. So leadership happens, it happens here and it will happen out there. If I could add just one thing to that. Um, going back to the reference to the Patriots, and I could sit here for an hour, <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. Um, if, you know, everyone makes fun of Bill Belichick when he does his press conferences, very short, and it's because he's holding back information, doesn't want to share it. However, you'll notice one thing, he will not talk about himself. He gets a lot of the credit, him and Tom Brady, but he won't talk about himself. What he does is he defers it back to his team. This is what the team did. This is how these guys prepared, how hard they did. This is what the other coaches did. And as leaders, that's what you want to do. Everyone's going to try to give you the credit for something. If you're the top of the point of it, but it's all the support that comes down before, it, and it's up to you to make sure you push that recognition down to them. Yeah. About planning, you know, uh, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower planned some big things like the Normandy invasion. And one of the things he said was that plannings, plans, are, plans are pretty well useless, that on the first, first moment of the first day, the plan breaks down. First casualty of any action is the plan. On the other hand, he said, planning, prioritizing, thinking ahead, foreseeing problems, deciding, that was indispensable. What do you have to say about plans? I, I imagine with the Blue Angels, you had a very clear plan, perfectly choreographed. <laughs> we like to. <laughs> Our plan was was set forth in the briefing for each flight. And every time we went flying, it was different. So we didn't say, remember what we did yesterday? We don't need to brief, we'll do the same thing today because the elements always change, the weather being the primary one. And of course, we did, went to different locations all the time. But our plan was spelled out in the briefing. And it was, the briefing was institutionalized. We had a specific way of doing it and very few places or people are gonna do a brief like we did, but in that brief, we focused, we got tremendous focus. I would tell them verbatim what was gonna happen in that flight. I would go through that recitation of how, what they were gonna hear in the flight and in the same cadence. So they would close their eyes and, 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 and move their hands like the throttles and the stick and actually fly the mm. flight before we went flying. And that's how we nailed down the planning. Yet, 
things always changed. The weather could change mid-show. Then we had to go from maybe a high show where you can do those, all those overhead maneuvers to a low show where you can do some rolls or maybe even the ceiling got low enough and we had procedures for this, three different shows, down to a flat show. And if it got too low, we'd cancel, we'd, we'd knock it off and quit. Um, so we had backups and contingencies. Here, here is, here's a fun one. How close do you think we were flying? Shout out a couple numbers. How many feet? Three feet, three feet, good job. <laughs> think about the distance between your head and your feet right now, that's three feet. We're going 400 miles an hour with texture and maybe inverted, that close. If, as a wingman, you got uncomfortable at three feet and you started bobbing a little bit, you could move out to clear airspace five feet away and really relax. <laughs> so at five feet away, you were really able to relax because at three feet, you were working your tail off. I like to call that area now, put it in the modern vernacular, your safe space, right? So, <laughs> That's right. right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, could, you could move out there. And that was something we talked about all the time. And it was okay. And the crowd never even usually saw you at five feet instead of three. And we accepted that. And we preferred that. If you weren't comfortable, get out there where you can relax, get it back together, and then come on back in. A lot of contingencies like that we briefed. So the plan we put forth in the briefing, and we spelled it out very specifically. We compartmentalized all the other stuff in our lives. So, and we always talked about when the canopy comes down, Everything else goes away except that flight. So planning is critical, but planning has to be based on what you think your capabilities are and what you've trained to. So the training is essential. That's how we did it in the Blues. That really echoes an experience of mine as uh, playing soccer for a great soccer coach. And what Juan used to do was get us off on the side of the field, seated really close to him, listening to him. And this is like that planning, that pre-brief, that rehearsal you were talking about where they'd be actually saying the words and moving the stick in their mind. Juan would say, the game starts, there's the whistle, and Kovaleski is going to pass back to Lichtenberg. Lichtenberg will take it on the right side of his foot and move it over to Leitman. Leitman, and you know, our stats showed it. We started the games better, more in the game, so our first quarter scores were ahead in every game we played that season but one. It was one getting us into the game, I think. Sure. Really interesting exercise, I think. Sure. Well, I think we did the, many of the same planning factors as well. So when, you, when you're getting underway, uh, you, and any time you're doing a, a high-risk evolution, like an underway replenishment, um, and we, you know, you're, you're 150 feet away from another ship getting uh, either provisions and, and or gas or one or the other, um, all, all those evolutions have to be briefed. And part of that briefing is actually you know, what could go wrong and management, the management of risk. And, and that's important. So, and everyone gets up there. So, the, one of the things that, that I did was, um, instead of having the person who was giving the orders kind of brief the emergency plan, I made the uh, the, the most critical folks get up. Like, you, in, in, to to the earlier point, the person on the helm. When you know what he was the master helmsman for these high risk evolutions. What are you going to do? And that person would get up would say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And then if I can't do that, I'm going to, you know, I'll shift my rudder to after steering. Okay, after steering, helmsman, what are you going to do? That gave everyone the confidence, and particularly me, it gave me the confidence that A, they knew what they were going to do and what actions they would take, but also gave them confidence that if this thing came down, that they would be able to react and do their jobs. And everyone around knew what they were going to do as well. And when I start instituted that, that became a, a kind of a big deal because those those sailors gained a lot of confidence and started training their sailors in much the same way. Interesting. Very good. Yeah. Were you able to work on planning? Or? So we were um, historically behind in the planning phase of things. <laughs> um, to be honest with you. And, and, You'll hear when I speak about a lot of things, I'll talk about the negatives just because we've learned a lot from it. Um, operational planning for us was literally drawing something up in the dirt uh, before we go out and do something. Hey, you're going to be in this corner, we're going to be in this corner, the undercover is going to go here. Um, Waco happened several years ago. For those who don't know about it, it was uh, a massive search warrant that we were doing. Uh, we lost four agents that day. Um, we learned a lot from that day. One was leadership. We had leadership that was making decisions. Some of the leadership was in a helicopter flying around. 
far from the scene. Another one uh, were leaders in Washington making decisions on what was going on in the field that day. Mm. Never should have happened, and it hasn't happened since. Um, the decisions need to be made by the people who were there. There were people saying, oh, they know you're coming, go. It should have been, don't go. Regroup and we can come back another time. But somebody in Washington decided that we'd spent X amount of money, we're going to do this today. Bad call. Plans, when it all went bad, and it went bad, it, it doesn't get much worse than it did that day. We didn't have the plans in place for the medical evacs and so forth. And there's a lot of video, and pe most people have seen it. Um, there, there were not the sufficient plans in place. Now, I would argue, and there'd be other agencies that argue against me, but I would say that we have the best operational planning now. Matter of fact, a lot of agencies steal our operational plans. Um, based on our experiences, what we did wrong, you will not go out the door to do anything without a formal operational plan that is signed off by two levels. But in that plan, even if I were any major operation out on the East Coast, I have to sign off on it. But in that plan is a contingency that if anything changes within this, the leaders there on the field get to make those decisions, not me in Washington. It'll be those leaders out there. So our operational plan has come a long way over the years. You were talking a lot about uh, the kind of optimistic, the glad to be here attitude. And I picked up the same thing from Captain Triplett. There's a kind of a a confidence and a shared optimism, but, but how about what is the best frame of mind on entering an operation? Is it the, the spirit of the optimist or is it the spirit of the realist who's given a lot of attention to what could go wrong here? Optimism, realism, what's the best frame of mind? Well, I'll, I'll check, take that one on. Um, I would say a mix of both. Okay. I, I think that as you, you go into it that we won't fail, but that you are kind of look at everything from all angles and you really push your team to take, take that realist view of, and when I mean your team is your core, your, you know, right. so your number two, your, your department heads are all involved in this planning. So there's, there's that, that, that shared, uh, we're all in it together type of deal and then what could realistically go on and how we kind of plan around that. But to the crew, you want to make sure that they're set up for success yeah. that, and the way they're set up for success is we thought through those tough problems. Right. We, we were realists behind closed doors. When we open the door, we are optimists. We're going, we won't fail and this is how we're not going to fail. But at the same token, um, and in my story, uh, I had to tell the crew what was going on. Sure. But they never lost faith. They, we were all optimistic, upbeat, and we were all in it together. And there was some, and it was all kind of a, a shared burden, if you will. Um, but never ever a, a loss of faith. And the, the real reality is that we found found a way, yeah. and uh, and we planned our way, and we worked very hard to be able to do that. And uh, and, and they did that. So. Again, a, a combined approach to being concerned, but being optimistic at the same time, really focusing on what could happen, but really, really paying attention to how you were going to get the job done. I don't think there's, you know, I, I can't say it was totally optimistic. We wanted to achieve perfection, but it was never going to happen. So we knew that, so we stayed realistic about it. Mm -hmm. I agree also, it, it's a combination. Uh, I think now, as management evolves, there's a lot more sharing of information um, as far as letting your crew, your team know what's happening. You know, back in the old days, you know, you go to the doctor and, you know, you'd ask him, hey, what's going on? He's, oh, you're going to be great, you're going to be great, and you're dead three days later because he didn't want to tell you, you know, how bad it was going to be. And now, by sharing that information and letting your crews know, you know, you even see it on the airliners now, today, you'd be sitting there, hey, this is what's going to happen. Before, they never told you anything. All of a sudden, you just bounced out of your seat or whatever. But now they'll tell you, hey, we're going to have some turbulence. This is what's going to happen. And so people just mentally can prepare for it. Same thing happens with your teams. You tell them what to expect, what you're hoping to achieve, but this is what could happen. And then they're mentally playing that game as you move forward with the operation. Good. We've done... We, we do have some questions, and we'll turn to them. I had one more question that I would planned to ask, and I'd... I'd briefed the uh, panel that I wanted to ask it. We still have about 45 minutes left, so I think we'll have time for some questions. The, um, the midshipmen who I've talked to, and I've been talking to them for some weeks as I prepared for this event, I kept asking them, so what sort of leadership challenges are you facing? And during the election which filled the fall, and since then, the new uh, presidency, which began just this weekend, one of the issues that come up repeatedly 
is people who are squad leaders, who are company commanders, who are the senior leadership who organized this conference, have said that they're plebes, that is, their freshmen come to them. Their leaders, they're mentoring, as you said, that's a big part of what we do here. And they're leading by example. And one of the hard things they're teaching is the leadership skills. And another thing is, what is military professionalism? How do you really behave and model the right behavior? And a number of people have raised concerns with them that are probably like the concerns that were raised when President Clinton became president, because there was so much of an issue surrounding his ROTC and then his evading his obligation to serve after the ROTC. Questions, I guess, rose also around George W. Bush and his service in the Air National Guard and then missing drills and losing his authorization to fly. The questions that the midshipmen have reported to me have been really discomforting. There have been questions about how do I give my loyalty, my real admiration to a man who has boasted of forcing himself on women? How do I make a model of professionalism from this person who would say things like, yeah, I would authorize waterboarding and a whole lot worse, or when you go after the terrorists, you really have to take out their families. Does he understand the laws of war and what military professionalism is, especially when he's asked, but that would be illegal, and he says, if I tell them to do it, they'll do it. That's not the way we teach the obligation of military officers to refuse illegal orders. I also find questions that have to do with lying, questions that have to do with knowledge of the Constitution. Since at one point, speaking to the GOP, he said that yes, he would support Article I. These are the congressional leaders who he was talking about, I suppose. They had asked him about Article I, so that would be the powers of Congress. But he said he would support all of, all of the articles, including Article 12, when we know that there are only all the plebes who've taken plebe government know there are only seven articles. But he also seems to have said that he would open up the libel laws, which of course are carefully balanced with the First Amendment. What advice do you have to give to one of these young mentors when, as they have been, they're approached by a plebe with these questions? Uh, that's a tough one, sir. <laughs> and, and I thank you for asking. I think it's, it is a timely, it's a good one. But, I mean, I, I will look across this, you know, here in the theater, and I'm going to tell you, what I see is a, a reflection of American society. So when I personally came here and, and raised my right hand and, uh, and took, took my oath, you know, I, I wanted to serve. So... If you keep that fundamental premise in, you, why did you come here? Why do you want to serve the nation? The nation is made up of many people, many different people from many different backgrounds. It is in many, and you will hear some say that it is an experiment that should have failed a long time ago with the different backgrounds that, that we have, but we are all in this together. There are many layers in a chain of command. Um, you will, you know, when you get out to, you, and you'll find that here in whatever academy you have, there are many layers before you get to the superintendent. There are many layers before you get to the president. I will say that the, sec the, the defense department is being led by a, a, a hero, uh, you know, Secretary Max. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he will do his utmost to take care of the women and men in the Department of Defense. So, go back to service. Service is that one word that keeps coming up. It's what, I, you know, so you will find that some will choose to do something else after your obligation is up. I too came up with that, came to that decision point. And I'm still getting out of the Navy 23 years later. And I just <laughs> haven't been able to figure that part out. <laughs> but but in, in all honesty, I like what I do. 
why do I like what I do, even at the Pentagon? And, and for the record, I'm going back to work after this. So, <laughs> so um, but, but why do I like what I do? It's the people. It is the people with whom I work, with whom I serve alongside, whom I have served with over 28 years that give me hope. I look at you all. You all give me hope because you all are going to take my place and lead these fine American women and men that are out there and looking to you for that leadership. So I don't worry about things like what I can't control because change is a constant in this country. Not all change is good, not all change is bad. You have to look through that and you have to find why you personally are here to, and again, you are part of that small sliver of the American public that has served and is serving our greater country. So I thank you for that. And that's what would be my answer. Good answer. I think you, I think you need to look at it like the professor mentioned a, sec, a few minutes ago about <clears throat> the combination of realism and optimism. Optimistically, we're in the Defar Department of Defense. Our budgets are gonna go up. We're gonna get some probably better equipment, more training. Things are gonna get better in that regard. We have that optimism. I think realistically, we have to look at what was said and understand that we have laws. We have lawful orders and we have laws. We have this great layering that the captain talks about that knock out some of that BS that might flow downhill. Our president has surrounded himself with really good people. They're not gonna let him tumble the country. Trust me, that's, that's my feelings about it. And, but how do you handle those that are in fear? Fear is an awful thing. I would just say do the best you can to explain that our institution, our culture, will take care of us, will protect us. So that's what I would say to that. Sure. Civilian standpoint, um, very much the same. It does have an effect on federal law enforcement agencies, depending on which party is in power, it affects which laws may or may not be um, more enforced. Um, I will say this, get used to it. Um, change is, has been alluded to, it's happening. People's backgrounds are varying. Um, in the end, there's very few times that there's radical change that goes all the way one way or another. It's a pendulum that tends to swing back and forth. Um, we, it's particularly in law enforcement, depending on you know, who comes in, all of a sudden you find out, oh, they're shrinking the government. They're riffing people, they're laying off people. Um, and particularly new agents um, will come and they'll be in the academy and they're all stressed out about it. And, it. and I tell them, I was being riffed 26 years ago, I'm still standing here. And since I've gotten into this agency, not one single person has been riffed. I don't think it's going to happen on the next watch either. So just get used to it because it's just something that happens all the time. Great. Thank you. Questions, guys? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. your personal leadership abilities? Well, I, I will tell you, uh, uh, we kind of talked about it, and one of the things that, uh, that Boss Woolridge talked about was that debrief. Um, things will happen very fast, and, and what you have to do is to be able to capture what went right, but more importantly, what went wrong, so you can improve on the next evolution. That's how you learn. So in the midst of the evolution, uh, when you're flying probably at three, three feet away, you, you can't talk about it, but you can talk about it once you get, get, get down. And we did the same thing. After every, every underway, whether I was going to see or coming back and making a landing, we talked about those evolutions. Uh, when we did training events, we debriefed those things so that we became better and better prepared, and we all learned from each other, and we took ownership. Um, you know, if, if my crew did a good job, my crew did a good job. And if I, you know, and even me, I call myself on the carpet. I did something, mm -hmm. and that was my fault. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm number one. I'm, I was a CO. 
uh, and that's and it goes all the way down to who you know taking ownership for what you did. But there's always time to reflect. Maybe not when you're in the firefight, but there's always time to to pause after the event and to be able to take that and and use that in the next evolution. So sometimes that evolution comes sooner than you think, but sometimes it may be, oh my gosh, this happened when I was you know back at the academy, and this is what I did about it, and you're able to to reflect on those lessons and that builds your, your entire portfolio and it's one and it's yet another tool in the toolbox that you are creating while you're here. May I add thirty seconds to that? Yes, of course. In in this debrief, it's such a critical aspect of getting better and, and discussing and analyzing what happened. You know, why did this happen? What happened? You walk into that debrief, rank is leveled, and that's why as the commander, I'd say this is what I did wrong. You know, and, and somebody else says, this is what I did wrong. I'm not pointing the finger at them. You're figuring out how you can get better. It's such a, a beautiful tool for making your organization work better. And it has to be a safe place. So I would say the debriefing is just critical. It, it really is. It gives you that, okay, let's do this. It, you're probably getting a little tired. Put your hands up here above your head like this. Come on, come on, get a little stretch. <laughs> ah. Okay, at the end of your fingertips, 18 inches from you now is a Blue Angel jet. <laughs> we started at 36 inches, right? Yeah. Okay, we debrief through the year. We get about halfway through the show season, and now we're not at three feet anymore. We're at 18 inches. This is that debrief where you spiral up in your performance. In the debrief, you celebrate what you did right. You build on that celebration. You talk about what went wrong, of course, and you get that commitment from each individual to do better, to fix what went wrong. But you celebrate what, what went right, and you go from 36 inches from your head to your feet down to your, the top of your fingertips there, down to 18 inches because you've built that into the way you do business. So mm -hmm. those things that come up unexpectedly, you've talked about them, and now maybe they won't, they won't happen the same way the next time. Right. So. And for us, we, we would have the operational debriefs, which would be short right after an event. Um, and again, it comes to the leadership to create that in a positive environment, but also to keep it so, because our ops would end at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, everyone wants to go home. And you've got to create that environment where you're the last speaker, let people talk. And then the bigger operations, an Orlando nightclub shooting, a, a Waco, a Boston Marathon bombing. The Boston Marathon bombing, we did a complete whitewash afterwards, and then I traveled around to different management groups and spoke about the things that we did right and the things that we did wrong. There were plenty of both, because you don't have, everyone doesn't have to be in the fire to learn from it. And so you want to share those experiences. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Ram, sir. I'm Cadet Rohan Pal from Indian Naval Academy. So I have a question for Captain William Triplett. Yes, sir. So it's very important to have a proper and effective communication in order to improve efficiency of your team and have an optimum utilization of time. But uh, the bottom line of communication is to connect, to connect with people, with, your, with the men under command, and to be an effective leader. Right. So you know it when you have a good connection on the phone, but how about connecting with people in person? How do you sense that a connection has been made? How do you sense that uh, you're emotionally bonded and there's a growing synergy in your team? Uh, they send me emojis on my phone. <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, it's, it's a two-way street. You, you get to know each member uh, of, of your team. Uh, what, what I like to do is, and it was it, even as busy as a CO, but what I did was, uh, and, and my, my XO thought I was nuts, but he adopted it when he was a CO, was to kind of talk to each member of my crew. So we had this process called a division in the spotlight. So it was a, a way for me to talk to every single person in that division and talk to them and then talk to them again when it came back again. So, it, so you build a connection, uh, likes, dislikes, career, career aspirations. Um, sometimes you would find out things like, you hey, great, and, and the Captain True Serum would come out that they hadn't been paid for three months. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you, you kind of build that bond. And, when you, when, and I like to, uh, I'm not a fan of sitting down in front of the computer or being around. I like to walk around my ship. And I like to walk around my ship uh, at odd hours because then you really kind of see what's really going on. But then I would talk to, talk to them in their workspaces, uh, whether they were doing maintenance or actually standing watch, and you talk to them. So you kind of get a feel that that connection is being made. But uh, it started with that investment in the time to get to know them as, as a crew. 
And I will tell you, I found it fascinating when I was living in Yokosuka. I talked to uh, another CEO of a, of a JMSDF ship, a Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force ship, did the same thing. And, and they are actually required to do that. Um, so I, it's, again, learning from each other. And that's, that's how I, I actually uh, was able to do a good connection with my crew. Hmm. That's great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, Midshipman Second Class Lindauer. Uh, S.A. Crook, this is a question for you. Um, in Jay Dobbin's memoir, No Angel, he discusses the internal struggle coming from being required to think like those he's embedded with, like a criminal. So, sir, how, uh, how do you maintain your morality when expected to appear otherwise and act immorally? It's a great question. Um, Jay is a, a good friend of mine. And um, you, for me, and it's, it's different for everybody. You know, I often get asked the question, hey, did you like these people? Did you feel bad for these people? Um, I hated every one of them. Uh, it, was just, it was to a varying degree. Um, and so my motivation was, because um, when you go through certain aspects um, of this type of undercover work, you're a prospect. And when you're a prospect, you are abused. You're basically abused for a six month period to see if you can take it. Um, you're, you're not allowed to sleep. You could be physically beaten. Um, they don't feed you, and you go through this whole thing, and you're looking at these people, and, you, and, and they basically control your life at that time. And um, the rage from within is like you, you, you basically quell it by th thinking about how great it's going to be when they get sentenced to 15 to 20 years in prison. That was the sole motivator. You just live <laughs> for that moment. And some of the things that they, um, they do, you know, um, not to get tied up in those stories, but we had, it was an event, church. Church is anything but holy. It's where these guys go and they plot and they plan and so, this is where sometimes you'd be sitting there naked um, and all the criminal you know, talk would happen in these church sessions. No cell phones, nothing was allowed in there. So as a prospect I was there and at the end of it they would hand me whatever documents, scratch notes or whatever they did and I would take them out and um, burn them in a grill. So one particular day um, I was given the notes and went out. One of the members came out with me, which wasn't unusual burn these documents in the grill. And um, as I turn around to go back in, this, the president of Sergeant Arms came out. Sergeant Arms is a large guy, about 450 pounds. Standing there and, he, and they're like, prospect, get back in here. You could just see that something had changed. Um, as I was walking in, I noticed that the member who had come out behind me had a gun in his right hand. He was very close behind me. So we walked into the room and there, the members who were sitting there having church, all of a sudden one of them's got a shotgun pointed in my head and I could feel this guy's breath behind me with his hand standing there and my first reaction is rage like god they've got me and they hand me this document and they tell me to read it and it's about being a rat and they want me to read it out loud meanwhile they're, they're highly agitated and the guy who's holding the shotgun he's not the most stable guy to start with now the mind he's standing with a shotgun in my head mm. and the whole time i'm sitting there thinking about it and it, it's rage but it's like you try to get past it you try to start thinking okay what am i going to do i don't have a wire there's no way they're going to know how am i going to get out of this and at what point am i going to get out of this and talking to people like Jay and some others before, I'd gained some knowledge about, hey, you gotta know when to cut your losses and when you gotta hang in there. And this is one of those times I was like, I'm gonna hang in there, but if things go really bad, I'm getting out that plate glass window. They're at least gonna find me out there. But I hung in there probably a little bit longer from talking to other people who had done this before me. As it turns out, um, th th this whole anxious group is going back and forth and yelling and I'm reading this thing and I'm thinking, God, how did they figure out that I was a cop? And the chapter president come down and he fired something. Just instinctively, I put up my hands to block what he was throwing at me. I had no idea what it was. And I ended up catching it. And it was a soft patch. A soft patch being, you know, it's a t-shirt with the colors. It's not your full colors, but it's a t-shirt. And basically meant you had made it. That was their initiation saying, hey, congratulations. Great, great way to do it. But it, 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 it lowered that everything down. But it was that close to like, I'm going to dive out this window to now I'm a patch member in the club. So, and you learn that from you know, people, and you, but you keep that rage. And I never forgot that day. I never forgot that guy was pointing the shotgun at me. And he ended up getting sentenced to 99 years. And mm. I never forgot that because it was a huge motivator for me. Right, that's awesome. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name's uh, Mitch Jim in Second Class Surf. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. I had a similar question, but um, it sort of looks at getting trust, motivation, and keep, keeping your honor clean when you're having to do bad things undercover. So what's your driving force? Do you look at the greatest good for the greatest amount of people? Perhaps you have to do one wrong, so you have 100 rights or a larger cause. And how do you keep your honor clean, and how do you motivate your team when you're sometimes having to work in that gray zone? 
It's a great question. The, there are certain illegal activities that I was authorized to do. Um, if you ever decide to do this, make sure you get that in writing from the U.S. Attorney because it came back to haunt me later on. Um, but you were authorized to do certain things, but there were certain things you can't. And there were times where we were on our way to go and they were going to kill somebody. And I, we had to come up with ways to stop that. And it was a lot of pressure to try not to blow the case, but to, to kind of keep that going. But simpler incidences where women being abused and um, intervening in that and how to intervene in that without giving up where you are and witnessing it. And there was a fine line. You know, certain things, you know, somebody maybe screaming at their old lady, doing something like that, you'd let go. If not, you know, there was times where you see somebody go to strike somebody, you could kind of intervene and step in. I'll give you one example where um, I was a prospect and I was told along with another prospect to um, basically just beat this guy. Um, chapter president had no, he was just in a bad mood that night. He lured this guy down who disrespected him or he felt he did um, and wanted to put this beating on this guy. And so, you know, we took him out to the back of the bar. The guy tried to run and I ended up grabbing him and grabbing him harder than I thought I did. And he went down to the ground. He was kind of slammed down the ground. My club name became Slam based on these, these activities. But the other prospect was over 400 pounds, a giant guy, and he was kicking this guy, and this guy's neck was up in a curb, and he went to stomp on his neck. There's no doubt he would have paralyzed him, if not worse. I ended up sliding my leg over and taking the brunt of what he had done. Each of the blows that I was giving him were just skipping off him. I was actually pu punching the cement. Um, and because I had gotten on top and was doing that, the other guy wasn't really able to get at him. So you kind of took little victories in that, mm -hmm. those things where you could intervene and help somebody in that case. There were things that happened that maybe I wasn't in the room and heard about later on that I wish I had been in the room to stop. Um, but you, you can't be there for all that. And, and the motivator behind it was to get these people off the street. There were certain times you had to put up with certain things. Um, but the end game was always, if I can get rid of these people, get them off the street 5, 10, 15 years at a time, society as a whole would be a better place. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Midshipman Nell, U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, my question is also for Special Agent Croak. Uh, hey, all right. Sir, uh, it seems like in the military, a lot of times we have the luxury of having really easily defined victories, like a particular battle or finishing a deployment. How do you lead and motivate a team in something like counter drug operations where there may be no easy end in sight? There's certain, you know, certain things that we'll track, crime rates. A lot of what we do is based on violent crime. And so pretty much everything we do is based on violent crime. So we're looking at crime statistics. Crime rates, as you know, go up and down. And so you'll, we would try to, we don't have enough resources to affect everyone. So we try to go to the highest crime rates, crime rate areas and go in and infiltrate. Um, as far as the team goes, <coughs> to your point is, we have a system called Niven, it tracks ballistic imaging. And so you, oftentimes you'll find one gun will be responsible for 10 shootings, a um, couple homicides. It's, it's just not that many guns out there, but there's plenty of people out there who will use them. And these gangs will pass them around. And, and people will be sitting there and they're pulling these reports on these. seems that somebody sh shot a stop sign. Nobody cares. You tell them to go out and get this report and you've got to put this thing in there. And people are sitting there and saying, this is a waste of time. It's a stop sign. Nobody get hurt. This particular one where a stop sign was shot and, that, and an agent went out and got those reports and entered the ballistic evidence in. Um, <coughs> two weeks later, there was a shooting, um, and it was all, caught on video. It was gang members rolled up, innocent person who they thought was a rival gang member. He wasn't. He was not affiliated with any gang. They got out of the car. They shot him, paralyzed him for life. They, they drove off. There was, other than the video of the side of the car and the person, they never would have been able to put it together. But the, the shooting in, actually happened in Colorado Springs, 70 miles away. The ballistic connection, put it back. There was a Cadillac that kind of matched up, and then they were able to get some interviews. So you, you use that example coming back saying, listen, do you remember that stop sign shooting wasn't important? Well, that guy who was paralyzed thinks it's pretty important, and you should too. And you kind of use those real life examples to try to keep people, you know, their heads in the game. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Cadet Solomon from Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets. This question is using uh, Captain Woodridge's uh, buzzword of morale. So what I'm wondering is, at any sort of organization at the junior level, you don't have control over the kind of climate that the command has. And at the senior level, it's up to you to facilitate that kind of, your own uh, command climate. So my question is, how do you at the junior level raise morale at the small unit level and how do you, versus how do you raise morale at the senior most level uh, and in a position of command? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's a challenge. When you're, in, when you're a junior officer, let's say, 
and the CO's a, a butt. <clears throat> the, the way I found to improve morale for the whole squadron was to join up with the other junior officers and have fun. Let, let, let the junior officers do the planning for things, operational, recreational. <clears throat> Get involved with that to where you get distracted from that negativism. Unfortunately, that happens occasionally. That it's just all crap coming down from above. As a junior officer, you can get together and, and bond, still adhering to whatever the CO says you're going to have to do. But that that sense that's underneath the commander will will be felt above, and, and you might be able to soften that and improve the morale of the whole unit. I'm going to pass that off. To you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you two, two aspects. And, I, I, and in my career, I saw both sides. And I was that J.O. in a bad climate. Um, and, and, uh, and I saw, you know, I was a J.O. in a good climate. Back-to-back um, -back ships. Um, so I will tell you what, what got me through the, the bad times is, A, I still learned something. And I, there was some takeaways there that I could actually learn something. So we go back to what, you know, what are the takeaways from that? It, you know, once you decompress, you look at that. So what could I do for my division? Well, I could make my division, division successful. And that improved their morale because they were successful. They got the job done. They were highly respected. They, they were qualified. I was qualified. And so in that turn, it, so, so I would like to say that what I've learned is success breeds success. And it goes back to the, the other point as a more senior officer, uh, the one thing I learned, uh, going back to the question about counter drugs. So I, I did that, a six month counter drug deployment. You talk about, we did a lot of good fishing off the coast of Panama, <laughs> but <laughs> looking for the little go fast that was carrying the cocaine. But, and it was important that we find that go fast. And we did our best to go out there with, and we did. And we kept the crew focused on that mission. But we broke it up with other fun things. So you can affect that, provide the crew with some breaks of the monotony and, and, and give them that and lead from the top and find those things. But it goes back to the earlier question I asked. It's because I knew my crew. I invested in my division. I invested in my crew and getting to know them and, and you know, what would you know, keep them motivated, keep them occupied, and keep them focused. Really, go ahead. Go ahead. really the same thing on, for us it, is a group, and that's that small entity with the 10 agents and the group supervisor. Um, if, if that group supervisor is getting instruction from above, um, there's ways to package that. So you can kind of isolate them to the raw message, because sometimes it's just the delivery of what you're doing. Sometimes you just got to tell them, hey, that's what the boss wants, that's what we're going to do. Um, and as you move up, the, the most important thing is remember all that stuff and don't do it. <laughs> do it a different way. Package it a different way. Remember what it was like to be there and, and how frustrating it could be and how demoralizing it could be when you have those troops underneath you. That's a, that's a great point. And as, as a senior leader and as a leader, once you get to your units, it's, in, it's critical that you make it look like you're having fun in your job. And I don't mean the ha-ha fun, but you're succeeding. Wow, look what we did. Look what you did. Look what we did together. How did we get this done? That's amazing. It's critical. And, and, you're ha and that makes it fun, and that improves morale. You recognize that effort. So you've got to have fun. Happy socks, you know. <laughs> I expect that to be an Academy dress item. In the <laughs> Let me know so I can buy stock in happy socks. Anyway. Uh, have fun. Don't, don't do it just to, just to sh project it, but have fun yourself because you're grooming people to become leaders. And if it looks like you're having fun as a leader, they're going to want to do it subconsciously. So that's, that's a way to improve morale and, and, and impact it. Yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Jet Manzi, student athlete at Lafayette College. Okay. Um, so Admiral Bull spoke about how you can't always explain your decisions, but to gain trust, you can help others understand your decision-making process. Um, how do you recommend helping others understand this, especially in high-pressure pressure situations? Well, I think that what you can do is saying, hey, th this, is, this is how we got here. And one of the tools I used uh, was talking to the crew. So we had a general announcing system called the 1MC. 
And I would get on the 1MC quite frequently. So they were used to hearing from me. So I would tell them, hey, this is what we got to do. And, and there are going to be those situations. But you can kind of go around and say, hey, this is, you know, this was, you know, this is how we got here. And this is what, you know, and, and, doing, and explaining as much as possible. Um, and being forthcoming. Everyone that works in that organization will understand that position um, because we all kind of signed up to be part of the, you know, an organization like that. So in this instance, it's military. So some things are compelling. You can't say everything, but you can kind of kind of give the, the ground rules of what's happening, of uh, maybe you know, where we are today, what we're doing, and, and why it's important that we be out here. And you're going to have to you know, kind of change some things but, but being as forthcoming as possible uh, and, and including them and letting everyone feel included is key to, to that. I would just add to that, uh, in the marathon bombing, we had certain classified briefings where there was information that we couldn't share. But letting them know you can't share everything, but here's generally why we're doing it. We're looking for this, we're going to this area, we're interviewing these people because they could have information on it without giving the specifics of what you've got. Most people will get it. Most people will get that there's a bigger, especially if you tell them, hey, there's more to this, I just can't get into it, but this is what we're going to do. Um, and they'll appreciate that honesty because they've tried to kind of work around it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Brendan James. I'm a senior electrical engineering major, leadership studies minor, attending Hampton University. And my question is, if there was a time that you lost trust in, lost trust in someone from your team, what actions did you take to regain their trust? That's a tough one. So you've, you've lost trust or someone has lost the trust of the rest of the team. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And how do you renew that? Uh, you have to explore what caused that breakdown and how do you, how do you fix that and, and what's their motivation? Rarely would you have to fire somebody from the team. Usually if there's a breakdown of trust, it's either a misunderstanding, if it's a deliberate action, then you have to address it straight on, you know, and make sure that it never happens again. And if that means removing them, then that's what you have to do. That's a very, that's a very good question, very tough. I, I would echo the same things. Uh, I, I think in, in some instances where there's a, a loss of confidence, you know, you'll have to see what you, what you do and then you can, Either that per, and then what are the root causes behind that? Because sometimes you'll find out that it was it characteristic or uncharacteristic, and what can you do? In some in some instances, you do have to make that hard decision that what is best for the organization or the team as a whole, and you've got to look at it in that lens. And in some instances, it may be that that person you get a new person in, um, and you and watch the team thrive be, and. But in some instances, you find out this is a one time. None of us are perfect. You find a way to, to, to make it right, and that person works triple hard because now you've shown confidence in their ability to get the job done, that they made a mistake, and then everybody works back towards it. Quick story. Um, this did happen to me. It happened to me in major command. I had a, a, a young, um, newly reported person, and we were, we were discussing something, and it was a personal matter, but this person I knew was suffering from PTSD. Okay, he did something UCMJ, meaning I could have taken uh, several different paths and, and just got rid of him. I chose not to. I chose to keep him aboard, I chose to forgive. Okay, um, that did not come easy. And because I did that, because I, you know, would ended his career, because I, I did that, he became a, he worked four times as hard mm. to regain that trust from everyone in the organization. And after I left, I mean, valuable, valuable member of the team on, the, on, my, uh, on my staff's next appointment. Um, so sometimes you gotta make that decision, and it goes back to what I've been saying, know your people. And I took a chance on him and it paid off. For, for me, it's t uh, exactly what they're saying is, is digging down and getting the facts, first of all, because you're going to get one side on where the problem comes from. Talking to both sides, get to fully identify it. If you've built your team the way that you should, 
which is with trust, most people understand mistakes are going to happen. But you also have to understand that if it is such a blatant breach of trust that you can't go back from there, that they do need to be removed because you'll lose the rest of your team. If they don't see that you're willing to stand up and take that hard line to fix a problem, if it's a true problem that can't be fixed just by forgiving, forgetting, and moving forward, then you need to remove that person, whether it's remove them from an agency, remove them just for that team. Maybe they need to change a venue, a fresh start somewhere else, but you have to be able to be willing to make that tough decision. And, and let me clarify one point. It, it does not mean that you don't hold those people accountable and to the standard. You do forgive them, but you still have to hold them accountable because everyone else is looking at you from, for that decision and what you're going to do about it. Thank I think you. We have time very briefly for this one last question. Who's been standing here for some time? Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Mitch Smith, Eric Uh And my final question is mid-air collision. Yeah, air collision. Good question. Good one. Oh, good one. <laughs> good one. I got to lead the team about four years, and we did have one instance where we had a fender bender. We swapped a little paint. Uh, all six airplanes were coming down the back side of this, this overhead loop, and I called, and we're going to break out and go in six different directions, pointing, from pointing straight down, and I called, smoke on, ready, break. And we all headed out. Well, number, the far right wing guy hit the guy to the left of him with his missile launcher. The missile launcher broke off the end of the wing. He hit the tail of the other airplane. Both airplanes were flyable. We knocked the show off. We landed, and we went in and debriefed. It was the only midair we had, the only accident we had. And um, surprisingly enough, it was the second to last show of the show season. So we had been flying all year, gotten better every time we went flying. We had been debriefing the whole year, going through all these procedures. And what happens? We have a midair collision right at the end. Our normal debrief was about an hour and a half. This one took two and a half hours. But we figured out what had gone wrong. We called old team members. Even while we were debriefing, we called them on the phone and said, did you ever have this happen and, and what are we doing wrong? We found out there was a technique of pushing the nose forward before you break that we weren't using. And we'd gotten away with it all year. But here we finally, we had a mid-air collision. I called my boss who was what Admiral Bull does now, Chief of Naval Air Training. I told him what we had done wrong, or what, what had happened, you know, that we'd had a, had a little, uh, little fender bender. And he said, well, well, what do you think? Did you figure it out? I said, yes, sir, we've got, we've got the situation analyzed. We debriefed it, we know what we did, and I'd like to get the guys back on their horses again and go flying tomorrow. Maintenance can fix the airplanes. The Thunder, again, fantastic. Mm -hmm. They can fix the airplanes and we can go flying. He said, okay, it's all yours. It was the trust we had up and down the chain of command. It was absolutely incredible. There are a lot of organizations that would have had you standing down for three weeks and you know, going through all this rigmarole, but we knew exactly what had happened because of the debriefing process. It was so incredible. That was our mid-air collision. That was the only one we had. Not going to, it doesn't matter anymore for me, but for the team. Yeah, we had that, uh, that mishap. But, but we were able to figure it out. And then the surprising thing again was it was toward the end of the season we, when we were at our best. We had done this spiraling up of performance, changing our beliefs, going from three feet to 18 inches. And then this happened. So anything can happen. But the response to it, immediately stop the show, land, and analyze. And that's how we took Thank you for the question. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Gentlemen, thank you for your remarks. On behalf of the Naval Academy Leadership Conference, we'd like to present each of you with a small token of our appreciation. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.